So this morning I'll be reading, be reading from the Anguttara Nikaya. It's a sutta that I know many of the monastics already are familiar with, but it's one of my favorites anyway, so I figured I'd read it. It's from the Book of the Nines. It's sutta number three. It's entitled Megia. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa. Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami. <coughs> Thus have I heard. On one occasion the Blessed One was, was jel- dwelling at Chalika on Mount Chalika. Now, on that occasion, the Venerable Megia was the Blessed One's attendant. Then the Venerable Megia approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, stood to one side, and said to him, Bhante, I would like to enter Jantugama for alms. You may do so, Megia, at your own convenience. Then, in the morning, the Venerable Megia dressed, took his bowl and robe, and entered Jantugama for alms. When he had walked for alms in Jantugama, after his meal, on returning from his alms round, he went to the bank of the Kimikala River. As he was walking and wandering around for exercise along the bank of the Kimikala River, the Venerable Megia saw a lovely and delightful mango grove. It occurred to him, This mango grove is truly lovely and delightful, suitable for the striving of a clansman intent on striving. If the Blessed One permits me, I will come back to this mango grove to strive. Then the Venerable Magia approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said, This morning, Bhante, I dressed, took my robe, took my bowl and robe, and entered Jantu Gama for alms. And he relates the entire story above in the first person. I thought, This mango grove is truly lovely and delightful, suitable for the striving of a clansman intent on striving. If the Blessed One permits me, I will go back to that mango grove to strive. So if the Blessed One will permit me, I will go back to the mango grove to strive. As we are alone, Magia, wait until another bhikkhu comes along. A second time, uh, a second time, the Venerable Magia said to the Blessed One, Bhante, for the Blessed One there is nothing further to be done and no need to increase what has been done. But Bhante, I have something further to be done and need to be done, and need to increase what has been done. If the Blessed One would permit me, I will go back to the mango grove to strive. As we are alone, Magia, wait until another bhikkhu comes along. And the third time, the Venerable Magia said to the Blessed One, Bhante, for the Blessed One there is nothing further to be done, and no need to increase what has been done. But, Bhante, I have something further to be done, and need to increase what has been done. If the Blessed One would permit me, I will go back to the mango grove to strive. Since you speak of striving, Magia, what can I say to you? You may go at your own convenience. Then the Venerable Magia rose from his seat, paid homage to the Blessed One, circumambulated him, keeping the right side towards him, and went to the mango grove. He entered and sat down at the foot of a tree to pass the day. Then, while the Venerable Magia was dwelling in the mango grove, three kinds of bad, unwholesome thoughts frequently occurred to him sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming. Then it occurred to him, This is truly astounding and amazing. I have gone forth out of faith from the household life into homelessness, yet I am still stalked by these three kinds of bad, unwholesome thoughts, sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming. Then the Venerable Magia approached the Blessed One, paid homage to him, sat down to one side, and said, Here, Bhante, While I was dwelling in that mango grove, three kinds of bad, unwholesome thoughts frequently occurred to me, sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming. It then occurred to me, this is truly astounding and amazing. I have gone forth out of faith from the household life into homelessness, yet I am still stalked by these three kinds of bad, unwholesome thoughts, sensual thoughts, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of harming. Magia When liberation of mind has not matured, five things lead to its maturation. What five? Here, Megia, 
A bhikkhu has good friends, good companions, good comrades. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the first thing that leads to its maturation. Again, a bhikkhu is virtuous. He dwells restrained by the patimukkha, possessed of good conduct and resort, seeing danger in the minute faults. Having undertaken the training rules, he trains in them. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the second thing that leads to its maturation. Again, a bhikkhu gets to hear at will, without trouble or difficulty, talk concerned with the austere life that is conducive to opening up the heart, that is, talk on fewness of desires, on contentment, on solitude, on not getting bound up with others, on arousing energy, on virtuous behavior, on concentration, on wisdom, on liberation, on the knowledge and vision of liberation. When liberation has not of mind has not matured, this is the third thing that leads to its maturation. Again, a bhikkhu has aroused energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome qualities. He is strong, firm in exertion, not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the fourth thing that leads to its maturation. Again, a bhikkhu is wise. He possesses the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative and leads to complete destruction of suffering. When liberation of mind has not matured, this is the fifth thing that leads to its maturation. When Megya, a bhikkhu has good friends, good companions, good comrades, it can be expected of him that he will be virtuous, one who dwells restrained by the patimoka and will train in the rules of the patimoka. When a bhikkhu has good friends, good companions, good comrades, it can be expected of him that he will get to hear at will, without trouble or difficulty, talk concerned with the austere life that is conducive to opening up the heart, that is, talk on fewness of desires, on contentment, on solitude, on not getting bound up with others, on arousing energy, on virtuous behavior, on concentration, on wisdom, on liberation, on the knowledge and vision of liberation. When a bhikkhu has good friends, good companions, good comrades, it can be expected of him that he will arouse energy for abandoning unwholesome qualities and acquiring wholesome qualities. He is strong, firm in that exertion, not casting off the duty of cultivating wholesome qualities. When a bhikkhu has good friends, good companions, good comrades, it can be expected of him that he will be wise, possessing the wisdom that discerns arising and passing away, which is noble and penetrative and leads to the complete destruction of suffering. Having based himself on these five things, a bhikkhu should develop another four things. The perception of unattractiveness should be developed for abandoning lust. Loving kindness should be developed to abandon ill will. Mindfulness of breathing should be developed to cut off thoughts. The perception of impermanence should be developed to eradicate the, conce eradicate the conceit, I am. When one perceives impermanence, the perception of non-self is stabilized. One who perceives non-self eradicates the conceit, I am, which is Nibbana in this very life. specifically about those or just talk that is kind of like generally imbued with those things in mind uh, the question is uh, is the talk on modesty and contentment is right speech is that uh, talk about modesty and contentment or talk imbued with modest modesty and contentment um, if, uh, both actually yeah
talk about it can inspire you to talk about modesty and contentment can inspire you to speak with modesty and contentment. <laughs> What did, uh, did the Buddha mean in the beginning um, in, re in response to the question about whether or not uh, that bhikkhu could go back to the grove? He said, wait, we're alone, wait for another bhikkhu to come along. Yeah. What did you mean by that? The, uh, oh God, God, the, the Buddha told, uh, <coughs> the Buddha told Megia, Venerable Megia, you know, just wait, just wait. Don't go off to that grove, we're alone. So Megia was his upatak. Megia was the Buddha's upatak. And the Buddha didn't have another Upatak to take over, take his place. So uh, the Buddha's saying, like, wait, you know, I don't have an Upatak, don't just leave me alone here. And, uh, but Megyo was very persistent. And then the Buddha says, well, you talk about striving, so how can I, how can I stop you? you know, he's asking over and over again. But then uh, the Buddha knew that it wasn't right, the right time, his mind wasn't right for liberation yet, so... Yeah. He was, so that was early on before Ananda was his upatak. But I had some other, other upatakes. It's also, too, I, I noticed this, this time around that um, Megia is described as like walking and wandering for exercise, which is usually, it's a stock phrase that's usually used with... Um, with uh, wanderers of other sects, and I think it's in kind of implying that he's restless. He's sort of like he's out walking and looking around by this river, and so it's again another clue that you know that Megia is uh, yeah he's probably a little too restless to go off practicing alone in, in, a, in a grove somewhere. It's kind of like he sees this nice grove and he kind of gets excited about it, and so he's like going to the Buddha like, come on, come on, let me go to this grove. It's really beautiful. I can strive there. So the Buddha's kind of like, "Come on, you're not, you're not ready. Just stay here." He's like, "No, no, I want to go. I want to go." <laughs> yeah, you get one gets the sense he's quite restless. It is something I really appreciate about our training. It's like I think I came into monastic life having the thought about like. Yeah, just how much I get to kind of be alone, um, and then uh, for me personally, like I found that living in community has been probably at least as powerful as any part of the meditation practice in terms of you know practice and then purification and just living with others has been uh, like huge. And I just think that Longport Chow was so wise to make that so central. Really appreciated that. Good yeah, comment. good friends, good friends, associated association with good friends. That, that was the same with me too because I read about Mila Repa and I, I wanted to be a yogi so I, before I came here I went really deep into the mountains and in, in the forest and was going to meditate for a week and only meditate but then I didn't know how to realized I didn't know how to meditate and so the first night was just like I was really scared of wild animals and and my mind wouldn't calm down at all and it was just a lot of restlessness and agitation and ended up walking out on day two because I couldn't handle it. So uh, yeah, the mind's not not ripe for practicing. I, I also like that bit about how um you know, he's, he's sort of exclaiming to himself, "My gosh, I've, I've gone forth out of, you know, out of faith into homelessness, and, and yet my mind is still sort of obsessed by these thoughts." And also, too, he's sitting in this really delightful mango grove, and it, you know, we can have ideals about the externals, but really, it comes down to one's mind. And even when we ordain, I mean, it could be especially when we ordain, we're kind of a mess. And uh, but it's it's through living with people. That we uh, that we come to sort of both grind away our defilements, but also learn from really good role models, and uh, that's actually the purpose of the holy life, rather than you know putting on the robes or sitting in delightful meditation spots.
ചെയ്യും